more than others, uh, uh, some I didn't. But, but this next one is one that I must admit, when we were presented with the song, I was not very enthusiastic. I kept saying, well, this is like a comedy song, you know, we, Peter and Gordon have done some quite beautiful records, this will make us a novelty act, and blah, blah, blah. And it was, uh, to his credit, it was Gordon who persuaded me uh, that not to be so snooty, that this song they've given us could actually be a hit, even though it was admittedly silly. So, uh, in retrospect, I'm very glad we did it, because in, it actually turned out to be a, a huge hit. So I realize now that it's a song of great artistic merit, and I'm very proud to have recorded it. But what, we, what we did was do it as, as musical and, and sort of silly as we could. To, to emphasize which, I'm gonna play the banjolele, a, a bastard son of a banjo and a ukulele. And uh, to give this song its proper musical uh, touch. And here's the silliest song, well, not quite, but almost the silliest song we've ever recorded Lady Godiva. Ah. trips back to England, the time was going by and things were changing. Um, you know, the hippie movement had started to arrive. And, uh, of course, this influenced the Beatles along with everybody else. And, you know, they changed the way they look. Uh, we all started wearing beads and smoking too much dope and, and calling ourselves hippies. And uh, even Time magazine uh, recognized um, the, uh, the importance of that. And this was a Time Magazine cover from 67 of the Hippie Beatles. And we'll have one more trivia question here. What the hell? Wow. Anyone know the connection, a roundabout connection, between this Time Magazine cover and my family and the Beatles in a roundabout way? Gerald Scarf is a winner. Another box of chocolates. Another box of chocolates. I'm so sorry, we've run out. Um, <laughs> Gerald Scarf is the man who, of course, my sister Jane has been married to for the last 40 years or something, happily. And, uh, 
and he's the man who uh, did the Time magazine cover of the Beatles. Strange series of coincidences. Anyway, uh, well done, whoever that was. So anyway, we all wanted to be part of this hippie thing. We saw it, my friends and I saw it as an extension of something we already loved, had loved, which was the beat movement in America. We'd all been fans of Allen Ginsberg and Jack Kerouac. I'd even read Howell in the school poetry reading competition at Westminster, which caused a bit of consternation. And we decided we wanted to start a bookshop and an art gallery. So two friends of mine, Barry Miles and John Dunbar, that's the three of us, uh, decided to start a company we called it Miles Asher and Dunbar because we liked the initials MAD. And we started the bookshop first. And we called the bookshop Indica. We took the name Indica from a plant called Cannabis Indica, with which some of you botanists in the audience may be familiar, perhaps. And, oh, or even not botanists. And, and uh, we, the logo would look like this, which gives you an idea of the kind of thing we were going for. We, we, uh, we all worked in the bookshop ourselves. I would help out when I wasn't out on the road, and uh, there's me and Miles behind the desk. My sister Jane would help out too, um, and actually the shelves behind the desk there, her boyfriend Paul had helped to put those shelves up, and, and he even also drew, when we needed a map to go from the bookshop to the next step of our operation, which was the art gallery, Paul actually drew that map for us. He's a good artist, so that... That's a map that uh, my only piece of Paul McCartney artwork is a map between a bookshop and an art gallery, neither of which are there. Um, the art gallery we did, uh, we set up in the, in the usual way people do. We'd decide what artists to exhibit, they'd set up, we'd have like a press opening and all that stuff. And, and you can see the gallery there, it's in Mason's Yard, and that's during one such opening. We also occasionally would invite friends down the night before the official opening if we thought they wouldn't want to be there when when all the press was there. Now, uh, it so happened that my friend John Dunbar, my partner who, who was running the art gallery, he was in charge of it, we read about and heard about this wacky uh, Japanese-American artist by the name of Yoko Ono. Uh, and we thought she sounded suitable for, for our avant-garde kind of gallery. So John got in touch with her, invited her to come do an exhibition in our gallery. And uh, she agreed to do so. We took an ad uh, in, one, in one of the papers uh, Yoko Ono, Indica Gallery, uh, and so on, and uh, at a, a, an opening day. And as I say, we also invited our friends down, sometimes the night before, to look at the art in advance. And of course, my friends at this point included the Beatles, who might also introduce to, to, to John, who ran the gallery. So we made sure they were all invited. And thus it was that, uh, that John uh, came down to the gallery. I'll let him tell you the story. You may have heard it before. But... Yoko was having an art show in London at a gallery called Indica Gallery and I heard this was going to be happening so I went down the night before the opening. Also the first thing that was in the gallery as you went in there was a, a white step ladder and a painting on the ceiling and a spyglass hanging there. I walked up this ladder and I picked up a spyglass and I continued with the writing and just said yes. But if it said no or, you know, uh -huh, something, something nasty something. like, you know, rip off or whatever. I would have left the gallery that because it was positive, it said yes. I thought, okay, it's the first show I've been to that said something, you know, warm to me. So I, then I decided to see the rest of the show, and that's when we met. So, of course, the fact that they met in, in my gallery could make me responsible for them meeting in the first place. And in the view of some critics, maybe responsible for the breakup of the Beatles. But I, 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 I absolved myself of that responsibility. And besides which, I think Yoko is incredibly cool. She was cool then, and she's, she's cool now. I think she's brilliant. Um, so, now I'm going to jump ahead, if I may, a little bit. I warned you I might, and, and wrap up the Peter and Gordon story. Because while all this stuff was going on, I was also starting to produce records myself. We were doing the gallery, we were doing this, that, and the other. So Gordon and I gradually stopped performing together. We never broke up as such. We never had a big row. We never did a last show. But we ended up drifting into a kind of hiatus. And we weren't really expecting this hiatus to go on as it did for 38 years. And indeed, once it hit 30 years, I think I, for one, was convinced that we would never sing together again. But actually, we did. Uh, what happened was uh, a friend of mine uh, who's a keyboard player on a television show, uh, a guy called Paul Schaefer, um, he decided he wanted to do a benefit for somebody I, I hope you will know uh, by the name of Mike Smith. Um, exactly. 
Mike Smith was, you know, the, the, the brilliant musician of the Dave Clark Five. He was the singer, he was the keyboard player, and wrote a lot of the songs, and he'd had a terrible accident. Paul Schaefer was a friend and admirer of his, and decided to, to put on a benefit, and, and, and this is how he went about it. I guess this was my wife's idea, you know, when she heard I was doing this. Kathy, my wife, said, if you could get Peter and Gordon back together, that would be a real coup for this thing. And I said, it's impossible. I made one call to a guy that I've known for years. He said, let me talk to my partner, I'll get back to you. Paul explained that he had decided to put together a 60s themed benefit to raise money to provide Mike with what he needed and asked me what it would take for Gordon and I to get back together for one show. I thought about it really only for a moment and realized that it was, uh, would be wrong to say no. So I called Gordon, asked him what he thought, and he shared my view. Clearly there was good reason to do it, no good reason not to do it. There was no way I wouldn't have done it. I really do share with Peter that you know, I think Mike is a great, great musician and a great guy. Called me back the same day. He said people have been asking us to reunite for the last 37 years, but this one, for Mike Smith, I think we're going to have to do it. I called him back and said, yes, we'll be there. So we did, the, we did this one benefit at B.B. King's in New York, and I'm very glad we did because it was really fun. We had to practice a lot, of course, up front to still make sure that we sounded pretty much like us because we hadn't done it for a very long time. But I'm glad we did because we got to do quite a number of other gigs in the next few years before Gordon tragically died, as you know, a few years back. And so I, I'm glad that we, we sang those shows together. And the interesting thing was that Gordon's voice remained uh, intact and wonderful. You know, the voice that I had modeled all those years ago, he had this big, rich, huge baritone. Uh, and that remained intact to the end, even when he was, wasn't very well and he was extremely grumpy, he complained a lot all the time, but we still loved him. But he, he was a bit of a complainer and a grump. But, but nonetheless, even when he was sort of hobbling on the stage, complaining about his knees and his legs and this and the other, he would then open his mouth and this amazing song would come out. And, and uh, not only his singing, but his love of music. And in particular, his respect and love for, for great songwriters. Everyone remember Buddy Holly. We decided that uh, we needed a sort of ballady type uh, record uh, to go with our list of songs that we, that we sing. And so we chose this one. Just you know
<laughs> so anyway, that wraps up the, the Peter McGraw story, but we'll jump back to the 60s now. Of course, by this time, Paul and I had both moved out of my parents' house in Wimpole Street, me to a, a flat uh, in Maribyrn and Wayne Street, him to his Beetle Mansion in Cavendish Avenue. And, but we were still friends, and, and uh, I was kind of a, never a retired B-list pop star with ambitions to be a record producer. But he and I would, would still hang out together, and and, uh, and even apparently, incredibly, according to this picture we found, um, occasionally even play together. The miracle of this picture is real youthful bravado, because if you look, I'm playing the bass. Now, I'm a really crap bass player, so <laughs> to have the nerve to be playing bass behind the best bass player in the whole of rock and roll while he plays the piano, it's just ridiculous. But I guess when you're young, you don't give a shit. But, but I wouldn't do it now. Um, uh, and then, I also, of course, occasionally got to visit uh, the Beatles in, in the studio. Not so much, they didn't like a lot of visitors, but, but I was on some of the sessions, which of course was a privilege for me, because I got to watch the great Sir George Martin in action. That's us all listening back to a playback of something. Um, but it must have been good. Uh, but there we are, laughing. Um, but uh, I don't remember what the song was, but, but we could probably find out. And Paul and I also spent long periods together, and he would talk about his, his um, plans for the future. Now, for most people, being a Beatle would be plans enough. Uh, that's about the highest achievement uh, in, in, in music, or turned out to be. But he, he also wanted to start a record label. And indeed, beyond a record label, he wanted to start a whole entertainment company. And he would talk to me about all that stuff. And you have to understand that Back then, record companies were extremely formal operations. EMI Records, that was the label we were all signed to, the chairman of EMI was a man called Sir Joseph Lockwood, and he looked like this. Now, in, in the next couple of decades, of course, all the record companies started vying with each other for the title of being artist-friendly. Well, it's really hard to define what artist-friendly is, but it sure as shit isn't that. <laughs> and back then, they kind of despised pop music. They thought pop music existed to finance their classical recording and their electronics divisions and all their other stuff. They really didn't take it seriously. And Paul wanted to start a label that was friendly to artists, that invited people to send in their music and would treat it with respect. And finally, this label got a name, which was, of course, Apple. It got a logo. And as that happened, Paul asked me uh, if I would be... First he asked if I would produce some records for the label because he'd watched some of the producing I was doing and he played on some records for me. And he asked me if I, if I would produce, I said yes. Then he said, well actually, why don't you just be head of A&R for the label, which means you're in charge of everything that gets recorded and who, who produces what, and who we sign and so on. And I said, yes, of course. Uh, so I became head of A&R for Apple and we all went off on a kind of world tour explaining Apple to everybody else. <laughs> Concerning records, film, and electronics. And as a sideline, whatever it's called, manufacturing or whatever. But we want to set up a system whereby people who just want to make a film about anything don't have to go on their knees in somebody's office, probably yours. Well, what we did, you see, we did this mad thing of like, maybe put an ad in the paper or something saying, send us your tapes and they will not be shown straight into the waste paper basket. You know, we will answer. We just got inundated with tapes and poetry and scripts and phew. And in actual fact, I don't really think we got any bands or any artists by that method. We never really got much from the send in tapes. But because people knew we were interested, we got, we, for instance, Peter Asher brought along James Taylor. What I would do actually was have uh, uh, I&R meetings with the Beatles once a week, or as many Beatles as would attend. Um, we would, uh, I've got a photos from a couple of them, I think here. This was one where some of the Capitol Records people were there, Stanley Gortikoff, who was the head of Capitol. That's Ken Mansfield, who some of you may know, who's, written books and so on, who's a cool guy. Uh, why there appears to be no furniture, I have no idea. I can't remember. Uh, there's Neil, of course, in the corner, and George talking about something. Sometimes we would ask the girls at the label to come in and listen to whatever we were playing to see what they thought. That's a picture of Jackie Lomax on the wall. Sometimes the meetings would get arg a bit argumentative. Um, this one, it looks like I'm, I'm worried that I might have to, to intervene 
um, between George and, and John, who appeared to be about to have an argument. But there was also me moments of, of great fun as well. I remember back there in the office, I don't remember where this was, but clearly we're all having a good time in some bar somewhere. It was, it was the, release of, the release of the White Album. Oh, I'm told by an expert, it was the, the party for the release of the White Album. But it must have been before the party, obviously, or after. No, before, because it's daylight. Or else no one came, one or the other. It seems unlikely. Um, anyway, uh, so there we were at, at Apple having all these meetings, and the Beatles, as I said, they would argue a bit, but they generally would support each other's projects. Everyone would have their favorite projects. You know, Paul McCartney was keen on signing Mary Hopkin, who I'm sure you remember. We all went to, you know, Twiggy actually saw her on Opportunity Knox, phoned Paul up, he called me up. We all watched her, she was great, we signed her. And it was Paul's genius that as we signed it, he already knew what song he was going to record. He'd seen the, heard the song, Those Were the Days, in a nightclub some months previously and made a mental note of it as being a hit song. And so we, he produced that with Mary. I helped him with the session in, at Abbey Road. And that became a huge worldwide hit. George, of course, produced Jackie Lomax, who made a great record with Eric Clapton and Klaus Foreman and Ringo and terrific. Didn't do as well as it should have. And then we signed another band called the Ivies. Yay! Yeah. Great. Ivies fans. And, and uh, interestingly, the Ivies weren't signed by Beatles so much. They were brought in by Mal Evans, the Beatles' roadie. He thought they were really good. We signed them. We made a record. Achieved some modest success in the UK. None in America. And then we had a meeting, and for some reason that I don't recall, um, rather than just cutting another record, we decided to kind of start all over again. So we changed the name of the band from the Ivies to Badfinger, um, pretty much the same guys, and and uh, I made another record, and Badfinger turned out to be an immensely talented band. As you probably know, they wrote some classic songs that have since been recorded by lots of other people, and have, have had monster hits. They also had an incredibly difficult time of it. I mean, it was a tragic uh, career story. They had some success, but they had deaths, and suicide, and family hell, and and career hell and all kinds of stuff. But they kept going. And like a lot of great bands, as people left and other people joined and people even died, um, the band itself and their songs and their music and the ethos of the band kept going. They'd hire new members and, and keep going around the country. And this is where Fate takes a hand in our show again because one of the later members of a later iteration of Badfinger, as they kept the band going, was none other than my own musical director and band leader, Jeffrey Allen Ross. So I thought, I thought it would be a crying shame to have a, an official card-carrying member of Badfinger in our band and not ask him to do my favorite Badfinger song. So I'm going to pass the stage over to Jeff. I just get to be the rhythm guitar player. And, and uh, we'll do my favorite Badfinger song. Please join in. What? Two, three, what? 